Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Steve Thayer. I'm from the DevOps guys. Um, so this is this is DevOps guy. We actually run the DevOps Cardiff meetup as well. So this is our mascot logo, DevOps guy. We've got the important things: beer, pizza. That's what everybody wants at a uh, at a meetup. Which hopefully we're going to have both later today, Matthew. Uh, a bit, okay, the pizza. <laughs> If the if the pizza can get past the security guard, we're going to have pizza at the at the intermission. Cool. Okay, great. So DevOps guys, we're basically an application management company. Um, for those people who don't want to run their own operations teams, we'll do it for them. Um, we believe that there is a gap in the market for companies like ours because we believe that that hosting is moving in a, in a direction. People aren't going to get what they want from cloud hosting providers. So we think that there's a gap in the market for. Uh, for Dev DevOps Superiors, or DevOps Sapiens, whatever you want to call it, the application management provider. Uh, and that's the gap that we're trying to fill. Um, that's the end of the sales pitch. Um, DevOps in a Windows world. So who here is predominantly a Windows systems administrator? Cool. OK, so it's about 50-50. So when, I'm at, when I start slagging off Linux, at least you guys can back me up. <laughs> cool. Excellent. So on that note, slagging off Linux. OK, <laughs> there is no doubt uh, uh, that, that DevOps and the DevOps movement and the DevOps tool set have come from an open source and Linux world. You know, Windows tools are, or Windows platforms are a second class citizen in, in most of the major CM tools. I'm sure the people from Puppet and that sort of stuff and they're, they're going to you know, disagree with me later on. And I know that it's rapidly changing. But the reality is, is that you know, it, it, they are second class citizens. And you know. I've had lots of conversations at lots of meetups and lots of conferences, which is where in a minute you sort of say you're predominantly managing Windows uh, environments and they just kind of glaze over and say, well, why haven't you migrated to Linux? And that's because the large investment bank that we, that we work at really, really, really likes Windows or the large retail client we, we work at really, really, really likes Windows. Um, I think a lot of the people also forget that IIS, according to Netcraft, and you can't actually see Last month, IIS is a more popular web platform than Apache. Deadly silence. <laughs> but it's Netcraft, and Netcraft can't be wrong. Um, the, actual answer, the actual answer is this is market share of all sites worldwide via Netcraft. Um, and historically, I'm pretty sure that when, it, when Apache was reigning it over uh, IIS, that uh, everybody would have said that Netcraft stats are really awesome. So if you've agreed with that in the past, you've got to stick with it now. Interestingly, the, the stats are a fair bit different uh, when you look at the top 10,000 websites um, and when you actually look at the number of servers. A lot of this is the result, apparently, of, um, of Chinese server farms choosing to, run, choosing to run IIS for all their little spam and SEO websites. So those numbers <laughs> kind of go up and down. You know, I wouldn't have thought that IIS was the spammer and SEO um, um, spammer uh, platform of choice, but who knows? Apparently it is. Um, when you actually come over here um, for the top 10,000 websites by traffic volume, according to um, trends, the built with site, it's actually 39% Apache, 17% IIS, and about 20 odd percent um, uh, Nginx. But even if you look at that, so 17% of the market of the largest websites in the world are running on IIS. So 20% of your market. If you're a major software vendor, you cannot choose to ignore 20% of your market. So you know, I think it's really important to make sure that we, we try and push the vendors to, to make Windows a first class citizen. As I said, and I'm sure that the chef people will, will explain why it is now a first class citizen, even if we might not agree. I think it's also worth talking about where Windows has gone with um, uh, the, the platform. I mean, Windows historically is a GUI. Um, but recently, you now have Windows Server Core, which is Windows without the Windows. So you know, when, when, when a, a, an organization, a multi-billion dollar organization that, that has massive revenues, that is known for making a graphical user interface server platform, is now selling a server platform that doesn't have a graphical user interface, I think that gives a pretty good steer on where parts of the market are going and what people are looking for. People are looking for lightweight OSs they can run in large server farms that can be administrated um, easily and quickly via automation. So you then get the equation 
of PowerShell. So um, of those people who put their hands up and say that they're Windows administrators, who would classify themselves as a PowerShell coder or good with PowerShell? Okay, so that's probably about half. Would you say there's about half of the people that, that put their hands up earlier? So that's, a, that's a, an interesting thing where, where, where the, the Windows market is going. If you're going to be useful as a Windows systems administrator in the future, then you're going to have to learn PowerShell. That's just a given. Um, so that to be really controversial, does Windows Server Core plus PowerShell, a first-class scripting language, does it equal Linux? Oh, no. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna duck for cover now. Wait, wait for the uh, you know wait for all the uh, the people to come in and slag me off. But it's it's just somewhere along the line in a senior level in Microsoft, they've seen what's been happening in the in the Linux world and in the automation world, and somebody is actually listening. And it's really apparent if you start to look at the direction they're pushing the platform that it is starting to become. Uh, you know, aimed at being headless, aimed at not having a GUI, aimed at being, you know, script administered, which I think is an interesting um, trend to see what happens. And I'm interested to see whether there is actually an increase in adoption of Windows as a platform as it actually becomes, um, uh, well, a resurgence in Windows as a platform as it literally becomes easier to administer. So uh, what we do a lot um, as DevOps guys is build what we call, you know, DevOps application delivery pipelines, you know, how to move from your planning phase through code, build, test, release, deploy, and operate. Um, I very firmly believe that operations of the future is going to be focused on building that pipeline. Yet it will be ops that will own that whole delivery pipeline, not just focusing down here at the end of the stack. The reason that we have to own that pipeline is that because of the rates of change that we want to see where people are deploying you know, multiple times a day at minimum and if not, if not even more, we can't be expected to stop and have a cab meeting for every change you want to deploy into the production environment. You know, you certainly can't have the weekly cab meeting. You can't get everybody in a room. I mean, you know, I, I love cab meetings. I've never seen a meeting where you have, you know, you have 15 people in a room, like 10 operations people and sort of five sort of project manager-y kind of people. The 10 operations people have all got their laptops. They're sitting there with an event-driven kind, of, uh, kind of thing, waiting for their name or the name of the project they're working on or the change they're trying to be popped up so they can stick their head up and say, yeah, we think it's a really good idea. And then they go back to their laptops again. What an absolute waste of everybody's time you know and if any of you have a really good cab meeting that that, that, that is adds value to your organization please come and tell me about it later because I've never seen one and I've worked at a lot of places in the city so we can't deliver uh, we cannot um, focus on inspecting every single change. So if we can't expect every single change, we've got to do what they did in the automotive industry many years ago, and we've got to actually focus on the quality of the pipeline, the assembly line, the production line that moves those changes through into production. Okay, so as operations people, we're gonna to start to become, you know, what would call, be called sort of production engineers or production line engineers, um, in, a, in an automotive world that we're going to be focused on the building of this pipeline. So just to give you some, some products that we like to use. Um, so first of all, in the plan phase, we like the Atlassian stack. So we'll use Jira, Confluence and HipChat. You know, we really like those products. We think they're very good for, for promoting collaboration. HipChat in particular or Slack if you want to use Slack or whatever other you know, um, chat tool that you want to use. Very, very useful to start um, to promote collaboration, particularly when you're a, a sort of a third party outsource provider in a remote space. Very good to get in there and jump in and have a quick conversation. Um, code, we funnily enough, we don't particularly like um, Team Foundation Server, we prefer to use Git. Um, you can now use Git with TFS um, under the covers and use the other features of TFS. I don't know what the other features of TFS are that you would actually want to use, so I wouldn't bother using it at all. Um, so it's the one Microsoft product that I don't like. Um, Team City is our build server of choice. Um, pluses and minuses, if you know, a lot of people want to use Jenkins, Hudson, um, uh, uh, what's the other one? The name's got out of my head. Um, so, but you know, again, we, we prefer Team City, it does what we want it to do. 
Um, selenium and spec flow um, in, the, in the testing place, um, end unit, whatever your testing stack of choice. Important to, you know, important to understand. It's very interesting when you look at this diagram is that, is that it test is in the middle of this pipeline, three on either side, yet it's not called dev test ops, it's just called dev ops. So I think there is a, still a, a, a challenge for us to make sure that we're working better with the QA community, particularly in terms of QA automation and, and, and pushing this forward. Um, in the release uh, space, so um, we tend to use um, ProGet as our artifact repository. Um, we don't have what we would call, we don't tend to use what we would call an orchestration tool at the moment because we haven't really kind of found one that we'd like. Um, very happy to have conversations with, uh, with anybody that's got a really good orchestration tool that they really like to use in a Windows space because um, we'd be very keen to know about it. At the moment, we just haven't really needed it. Team City kind of does most of the, or um, most of the orchestration that we, that we really need. Um, there are a lot of people you can have a very religious debate about using um, your build server as your sort of orchestration tool and sequencing and scheduling tool. Um, some people say it's really great. Some people it says will say it's bending that tool out of out of place and it's making it do things that it doesn't want to do. It works for us at the moment. Um, uh, Octopus Deploy is our preferred tool. Who uses Octopus Deploy in the Windows space? Okay. Octopus Deploy, uh, we love Octopus Deploy. Um, we know the guys in Australia really, really well. Um, so, you know, we definitely recommend that as our packaging and deployment tool of choice. And um, then sort of at the operate stage, uh, stuff like App AppDynamics, uh, Data Loop, um, Script Rock, which was mentioned earlier, and obviously PowerShell DSC as a, uh, as a, as a scripting platform. In terms of stuff that really works well, and we're looking at a little bit more deeper dive at some of the particular products, um, sort of integrate all the things you can't really see here, but this is actually a hip chat window. Um, I've had to blur some stuff out, but you can see in here you're getting stuff that's coming in from PagerDuty, you're getting stuff that's coming in from Zapier. So in the window with the client, they can see in real time when you're raising a ticket, when an alert goes off, when a build is triggered, um, you know, when Ansible might fire off, uh, you know, something else or, um, or PowerShell might fire something else and we fire all that stuff back into HipChat. And it's a really great way of, of keeping people um, uh, involved in what's going on and de building that DevOps collaboration. So if you don't use a tool like this, I can strongly recommend that you do. It's also very, very useful when you have, a, uh, when you have an incident and you have an alert um, triggers off. Um, I just go straight into HipChat now because um, a link to the alert is in there, so I can click on that and go straight to the alert and page of duty. There's all, um, the page of duty with the integration via Zapier um, creates a JIRA ticket for me, so I can click on the JIRA ticket link and then I can hit start progress and, and make, I'm tracking the amount of work that I'm doing on the ticket. Um, and I can jump in there and say, yes, I'm, I'm working on it. Um, um, it's, it's, it's all being handled. So it's a great way of, of closing the loop and keeping people, um, um, keeping people busy. Actually, there is actually, see that in a little bit more detail. Um, JetBrains Team City, you know, we, we mentioned before. Why do we like uh, like Team City? Um, you know, we think it's easier to install and maintain, um, particularly in a, in, a, in a Windows environment. Um, there's an extensive range of .NET plugins for most of the things you would want to use in a in an IES and .NET space. Um, it's got commercial support. Um, I talk about this actually, the commercial support thing in a couple of the slides you're going to see in a minute. Who here has ever responded to a large RFP type bid process for, for something? Okay, so, you know, okay, so quite a few. How many of them had a line in that RFP wanting to know the support arrangements that you are, that are available and can I have this one hand up, the guy's nodding his head going, yeah. And, you know, it can be a real challenge with the procurement mindset. They want to know what's their platinum level, you know, absolutely guaranteed, you know, the, the kind of Microsoft style PSS level of support arrangement, SEV1, drop everything kind of support that they're used to in a, in a Microsoft and commercial closed source world. And it can be difficult to get them to move towards open source tools simply for that reason. The tech people might want open source tools, the business, you know, the, 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 the management might be happy with open source tools, but it can really stumble at the procurement stage. And that's why you're getting people like CloudBees and 
you know, offering offering support for um, uh, for the continuous integration. That's why you're seeing, you know, Chef and Ansible and all these having support arrangements and commercial commercial add-ons um, because it really is a stumbling block. And in this case, you know, JetBrains are a commercial organisation, so we don't have that problem. Um, we are a JetBrains consulting partner. That's not the reason we promote JetBrains. We became a JetBrains consulting partner because we were putting JetBrains and Team City um, into our customers, and we figured we might as well at least make some money on it. Um, so we like the product, it's not the other way around. Um, that rule also goes the same for Octopus Deploy as well. We were using it long before we ever actually even started um, DevOps Guys as a company. Um, arguably, some people would probably say it's the de facto standard for .NET now. Um, it certainly seems to be the most common packaging mechanism um, and deployment tool that, that we've seen. Um, and that's not just because we've stuck it in a whole stack of places. Um, Simplicity um, compared with the Microsoft stack. Who does deployments in a Microsoft world and is using the Microsoft web deploy, MS build sort of stack? Anyone? How do you find it? Yeah, so that, the answer to that was, was like that. So, and that was our experience as well. We, we, we just thought it was, it was too, too complicated. And even, even, if, even from our point of view, even Microsoft didn't seem to believe in what they were doing. Um, I, think, I think that's getting better now, particularly with their web platform stuff that's coming along. They're starting to support it more. But uh, it was just, Octopus was easier. Um, great API in version two was rewritten from the API from the ground up. Um, and it's extensible via PowerShell. Um, and it's got very, very good security, which is again, when you've got clients in investment bank, they like that kind of stuff. Um, it's very distributed in firewall, f distributed environment and firewall friendly, um, which is not something you can normally say about Microsoft products, um, which is good, another reason for having a third party. Great plug-in integration with Team City. So you get a very nice stack with Team City and Octopus Deploy. And again, we're a, a, a consulting partner and a training partner for Octopus Deploy. PowerShell DSC, um, I'm going to put my hand up at this point. I'm not an expert in PowerShell DSC. We've got a PowerShell MVP on the team who is the expert in, in, in MVC. Unfortunately, he lives in Canada and he's not here to present tonight. So I can't answer any in-depth questions on, uh, on, on um, PowerShell DSC. Is anybody using PowerShell DSC? One guy and Steve's kind of, kind of nodding. Okay. Very, very new. Um, there are um, some people like Stack Exchange um, who are sort of very heavily, heavily behind it. They were sort of early beta adopters. I don't know that many major reference cases for it at the moment. I don't know whether you, any sort of big enterprises. That's the one, yeah. Okay, so um, reasons, <laughs> reasons to vote for PowerShell to see. It works on Windows, unlike Chef. It works on, pu on Windows, unlike Puppet. And it works on Windows, Unlike Ansible, and again, this is where I duck for cover, particularly for the chef and, uh, and Ansible and, and uh, puppet lovers in the world. We've tried most of those tools on Windows, admittedly probably not recently in the latest version, but we found them fiddly. We found that it was almost at the point where you had to do so much in PowerShell outside of the tool, it was kind of like, well, why don't I just write it in PowerShell and do win remoting anyway? So the point at which you dropped into PowerShell. Um, it's interesting that uh, Steve Murawski, who was at Stack Exchange, did a lot of PowerShell DSC extensions uh, at Stack Exchange, has now gone to be a community organizer in Chef. Okay, So Chef are almost certainly targeting DSC as the platform that they're going to leverage in front of, um, uh, in front of Chef. Um, and that actually makes, uh, makes sense uh, when you actually look at the diagram here. It's been written with this idea in mind that third party platforms can come in and leverage DSC. So it's almost like it is going to become a, a de facto standard. You can use DSC by itself, or you can effectively, it'll be the route that Puppet and Chef and Ansible probably end up starting to use under the covers anyway. The, um, so Microsoft supported, important to procurement, extensive via PowerShell. Microsoft would argue that they've used sta industry standard MOF files and industry standard um, um, SIM files or SIM formats. So in theory, you can use PowerShell to manage a Linux environment. In theory, I don't know anybody that does or would want to, but in theory, that's what the documentation says. Um, and it's gonna be, as I said, it's gonna be leveraged by third party tools like Chef. So why is DSC the future? This is a great quote from, um, the DSC book by uh, Jones and Murawski, it's available on powershell.org if you want to download it. And this really 
to me, you know, really resonates with me about where the future of, of, of Windows of systems administration as a whole is, and Windows administration in particular. Um, you could argue that uh, administration will potentially become intelligent editing of, of uh, text files, uh, and the Unix people in the room would say that we've been doing that for years. Uh, and that's, you know, that's essentially what Linux system administration is. Um, and you can have debates about the use of the phrase intelligently in, the, um, in there. So, you know, if, if you're not familiar with DSC, it's a basic sort of um, um, scripting language that you can describe the state that you want of your machine. You, that then gets compiled down into a MOF file. MOF file gets pushed out to the server, tells the server the state that it wants it, wants it to be in and goes and runs it. As I said, that's about the limit of, of, of my knowledge of, uh, of PowerShell. Um, if anybody wants a demo of PowerShell, we'll, we'll arrange one for you, um, of DSC, I should say. Um, I think another interesting trend with PowerShell DSC is there is a GitHub re um, repo, um, powershell.org slash DSC. Um, it's very interesting to see they're really trying to push an open source community around PowerShell um, DSC, um, uh, which I think is, a, is an interesting sort of um, a, approach from, from a product that's, uh, that's Microsoft. It was written with extensibility and, a, and an open source mindset in mind. Um, under the covers, so this is actually a, a snap from the um, uh, for, from the PowerShell book. Um, uh, sorry, from um, Steve Morawski's blog, where he's comparing DSC with Chef. Um, you know, there was lots of extra stuff: reporting dashboard, inventory tool, cloud integration, virtualization integration. Um, as I said, we're actively working to fill that gap. Um, we've taken a fork of the um, Stack Exchange repository. We've got a um, PowerShell MVP who is working on that to, uh, to push some of this stuff. We're particularly going to be uh, w working on a reporting dashboard and, the, uh, uh, and um, uh, some of that uh, inventory tool stuff uh, to try and make it uh, easier for people who come from a GUI Windows world to at least have some kind of user interface. Uh, into DSC. I'm sure there are other people who are, uh, who are working in that space. And that's it. That's my talk. I think that was how we're doing for time. Is that spot on? Perfect. Um, yeah, so if you need DevOps and you want somebody to manage your environment or you want to come and work for us because we've got, uh, we're hiring, just come and contact us and thank you very much. Um, okay, cool. So, um Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Milos. I, uh, I'm here to, to talk about deploying .NET applications with Chef. So my talk is going to be shorter uh, than Stevens and less col colorful, I have to say. Um, so let's get to it. So this is a little bit about me. So I used to work for Rackspace, then a couple of startups in, U in here in UK and abroad remotely. Um, so I'm essentially ops guy, but I do write a lot of code in my free time, like just like anyone else. So currently write a lot of Go. And I also blog about containers a little bit where when there is something I'm really interested in. So um, I run this blog site, so feel free to check it out. At the moment, there is a couple of blog posts about uh, containers and networking. And I also wrote some stuff in Go, which is also documented there. So feel free to check it out, connect. So I'm currently freelancing. Uh, don't work any full anywhere full time. Um, cool. So let's get to uh, Windows automation. So. It sucks, I have to say. I'm a, I, I have to admit that I'm a Linux system administrator. So before I set out to work on this project, I hadn't touched Windows for like, I don't know, 10 years, 12 years. And I came to realize that the automation still does suck. And I took the liberty of like taking a couple of screenshots from Twitter from Brian Berry, who is the guy who is actively involved in Chef community. And he happens to work on a lot of Windows Chef automation and as you can see, um, we share opinion. <laughs> um, so get, if, you, if you are about to do um, some Windows automation, like a proper Windows automation, the stuff we, as Linux guys, are used to work, we, if, well, like once we start working on the Windows uh, side of the infrastructure, we horribly realize there's almost no standards. And that's something we're just not used to. Also, what massively helps is at least at least basic Windows administration um, experience, that helps massively. So when I first booted Windows after 10 years, I, 
I was like terrified because I couldn't see, I couldn't find the start button because it disappeared somehow. But apparently it got re reintroduced. In 2012, you did first mistake, anyway. I was like, oh, where is it? <laughs> I was terrified. I'm like, I'm lost. Um, also, uh, you need at least uh, basic knowledge of PowerShell. At least for like basic automation, you need to know at least how to write like um, simple PowerShell scripts, and also advanced Google skills. I don't. Ideally, you need both if you are like me, if you're coming from a Linux environment, because otherwise you might be slightly lost. Um, Okay, so let's go to deployment pipeline, which we, this is the project I was working on uh, for one of the clients I was working for. Um, they're called Workshare, maybe you guys know them, maybe you don't. So they, they are running a couple of API services developed in .NET. It's pretty like basic or simple stuff, um, which is gonna grow into something more complicated. So that's why the deployment pipeline is quite simple at the moment, but I, I reckon it's just gonna get like more complicated and maybe they might even get in touch with Steve at some point. <laughs> um, so this is how it works. It's, it's quite simple. So whenever there is a code pushed into master branch, um, we send a webhook and then um, we build a package using MS build, uh, Microsoft build, and like MS deployed stuff. And then we tag a, we tag a uh, release on the GitHub and then push a zip package into uh, AWS uh, S3 bucket. So this is how we, this, this is essentially like you, you run the build, you run the test, it passes, you tag the release, push it there. Then, um, how do I, okay. Pointer? Pointer, yeah. Yeah, just the, uh, the, the top button, the, the one, yep. Right. Okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, so. <laughs> uh, that one. Oh, that one. Oh, sweet. Cool, and um, so we run a couple of, like, like I mentioned, we, we run quite a few like Windows, uh, Windows servers, and they um, run Chef Client continuously as a service, as long as it doesn't crash and need to restart it. And that, what it, what it basically does is it, it pulls down the uh, particular um, latest release of the code which passes the test, which passes the build, and it deploys it uh, using Chef. I mean, there is a lot of other stuff involved in it, and, but this is this is like essentially like this is the core of what we do. We also we we also have some uh, some stuff set up on Jenkins which allows you to deploy manually if if you need to. Um, cool. So I just want to give you like a couple of tips. I, I don't want to go like into too much like technical details. Uh, but how do we get to that pipeline? So first you need to provision the servers and. From our experience, like if I can advise you, just like try to bake as much as you want into AMIs. I mean, it might sound contraintuitive, or like you, you might argue against like golden images and that kind of stuff. But if you ever had to start a Windows server in AWS, you know you can go for a coffee or a couple of coffees. It's just it just takes ages. So try to get as much stuff installed as possible into into AMIs. That's that's my advice to you. Uh, Unless you have a lot of time and a lot of patience and all that stuff, uh, we also we also use SSH to access our servers and bootstrap all of our Windows servers um, using IPC2 and uh, via um, SSH. Cool. Uh, so let's go to uh, the Windows Chef stuff. So if you want to do some good Chef automation. Uh, on Windows stuff, do definitely do get familiar with, with uh, Windows cookbook and IIS cookbooks. Those are like, when we started working with these, like they were not great, but it's, things are just massively improving. So there is like, there's a couple of people who are working on these cookbooks, like uh, Julian Dunn and Seth Gismore and Doug Ayrton. And you should, anyone who's using Windows cookbook should send like lots of hugs to these guys because they're doing an amazing job on this. And they're like, Windows Cookbook is, um, has just improved drastically and it's like massively, massively uh, uh, useful. So we wrote our own like Windows uh, service cookbook, uh, which is essentially a wrapper cookbook, um, which installs uh, stuff like uh, .NET, Web Deploy, SQL Server, because some of the, some of the API services we're running uh, are, uh, are using like a local installation of SQL. And also it modifies the Windows right? basically a basic, um, basic setup until the deployment uh, step. Also, 
make sure your, all of your resources are idempotent because we have come across like some of the, well, in the early stages of the, the Windows cookbook, like some of them weren't, and that just like hit us a couple of times. So um, this is the things I want to like also give you like a tip. Um, disable the auto updates because they, you can always update, you can always upgrade your servers like separately and they can they can come they can surprise you by, uh, like uh, quite a lot because they they consume lots of resources and then you just like then you're surprised what's going on and then just like Windows is just like downloading insane amount of uh, insane amount of the data and it's just like just disabled and just upgraded like separately. Uh, also, turn off the shutdown tracker because like very often when you install something on Windows or I don't sometimes when you do it it you need to restart or reboot Windows. And shutdown tracker is like one of those things which asks you why do you want to restart, and it's basically you are there behind the console and just like running the chef and just like some nothing is happening and you realize oh cool it's a shutdown tracker, so disable these, and also if you want to use uh, if you want to use uh, RDP or remote desktop just make sure you um, control it somehow just okay this is the last thing I wanted to show you. Uh, this is the last bit of my talk, and that's the deploying of the .NET, the actual deployment stuff. So I, I'm not sure if I, I should have. <coughs> cool. Did, can anyone see this? I mean, so this is the, this is the recipe. It's in a gist. I mean, there is a link on the presentation, so you can like after the talk and just like go there. So this is how this is this is what we essentially are doing. Um, so I just want to go like quickly through the code in case you were interested. Um, what's this? Cool. So so this is I mean this is very like if you if you're if you're working with Chef this this should be like pretty familiar to you. So uh, we have like restoring um, sync secrets in encrypted data bags, and then. At the beginning of the deployment, uh, we retrieve the version, the latest version of the um, of the published artifact, uh, which is in the um, AWS. So that's why we pass the AWS credentials there. And then basically we, we construct some of the variables, and then we download we download the artifact, extract it. This is all. This is all. Um, so this this resource here, AWS S3 file. It comes from the um, pretty cool AWS cookbook, so feel free to check it out. And then the rest is just really cool, aw awesome window stuff. So here we just like unzip, unzip the file, uh, the Windows package. I, I essentially, what MS build, or MS deploy, whatever you call it, uh, does is just builds builds a um, zip file, which, like I said, which we push into AWS three. So we download it, then we unzip it in and extract it. Then obviously we, we just configure uh, some stuff like uh, database config and all the stuff. Then we set up some IIS sites, IIS apps, and then essentially this is this is the last part of the deployment. And then this is what deploys the application. And uh, the MS build, or if you use the MS deploy, it generates this. Um, I think it's a batch file, which contains, um, which if if you run it, it's just like syncs a folder to which you have extracted your files into the destination folder, and then you just restart the site, and that brings your site live. So make sure, this is one of the things, that you make sure that this, this last bit, if you ever do it like this, is idempotent, because every time you deploy the new code, um, uh, you need to restart uh, IIS, so that the new code is picked up. And when we didn't have this idempotent, we, kept, we would like keep on restarting um, IIS all the time around, and that would be like, that would bring us obviously lots of issues, and also to our customers. Um, so yeah, this is this is one of the things like which is which is super important, and this is also um, why you should always always tag your releases. It's not it's not just for tracking and tra tracing the the changes, all this stuff. It's also for stuff like this, where you can actually cha check the version of of the uh, deployed artifact. So this is how we do it. So this is this is also this is what I want to stress. Like this is what. Uh, beat us a couple of times, so make sure you do this. Um, and I think that's pretty much it for me. So if you have any questions, 
So this is a, a useful link. So feel free to check out the, the Windows cookbook is really awesome. Uh, IIS, then you have like a couple of uh, .NET cookbooks and SQLC and uh, Knife Windows, all this stuff. OK, that's, that's it for me. You don't need to introduce me. I'm Stephen. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> He's Matthew. He's terrible. Um, so, um, Chef and uh, Desired State Configuration with PowerShell. Um, I've been using Chef uh, for ages and ages. I've trained quite a number of you in the room, including somebody who's now working for Chef. Um, so, I've been doing this for ages. Uh, I'm not a Windows expert. I've done a fair amount of Windows, but I'm a Unix guy. Um, however, I will point out on a number of occasions that I think that Microsoft is going in a really fascinating direction. Uh, if you'd asked me a couple of years ago what was the most advanced operating system on the planet, I'd have said Solaris 10 or Solaris 11 on account of the fact that it has all sorts of amazing and fascinating things in it. If you were going to ask me what the most advanced operating system on the planet is now, I'd say it was Windows Server 2012 R2. Uh, and if you are not already taking a look at Microsoft's technology stack, you should. Okay. So uh, I'm going to begin, having had some technical conversations, I'm going to begin with a bit of a prologue, which is going to delve into philosophy and sociology. So I'm going to put forward uh, the idea that configuration management maturity is a prerequisite for organizational effectiveness. And by this I mean, as people who work within IT, we have a bit of an existential crisis. We say to ourselves, you know what, what are we actually here for? I mean, why am I sitting here? cranking the handle on the computers? Why am I in the server mines? Why am I doing this? And actually, what I think it comes down to is we're working within IT fundamentally, apart from for our own interests, within the context of our organization. We are there specifically to make sure that our organizations meet their specified aims and objectives. So if you know what your organization's aims and objectives are, raise your hand. OK, so uh, that's about. Um, 20%. 20% of the people in the room know the chosen and set goals of their organization. So you're kind of starting from a bad place. And that isn't, in, that isn't very surprising. So if I were going to ask you to draw a little graph, a distribution to say, if you were going to think of all people who work in IT across the world, and you were going to draw a distribution curve to say, how effective are they at doing their jobs. How effective are they? Bear in mind, I said effectiveness is making their organization meet the specified goals and objectives. How effective are they? And I think most people within well, this room, and most people, if I were just to ask a person in the street, I think they draw a curve a bit like this, where they basically say, well, there are some people who are really, really terrible. And they, they just suck at life. They're dreadful at their jobs. They're terribly ineffective. On the other hand, there are some people who are really, really, really awesome. And then there's some people in the middle who are average. Uh, and if you can't read the writing, it says, you are below average. And the little one says, you're mean. I thought it was very good. <laughs> um, now, the interesting thing is, uh, it's actually been demonstrated and measured and explored by a number of uh, thinkers. But this is actually woefully incorrect. Oh, that's a bit dim, isn't it? That's a bit. That curve is shifted to the left by about two standard deviations. So in practice, when you measure the effectiveness of organizations, you find that the vast majority of organizations are kind of all right. They're not really middle of the road good. They're just a bit inept. Uh, and then there's a few who are really terrible. And then there's a long tail of getting better up to the really, really awesome. Now, I want to put it to you as an idea, and that's an idea that I happen to hold on to, that there is a configuration management maturity model which maps very closely onto how effective you are within your organization as a person in IT. And there are five levels to this model. So the first level is level one. So all our machines are handcrafted snowflakes. They have names. We cuddle them. We love them. Uh, there's no <laughs> shared knowledge. The person who knows how to run that machine is one person or maybe two people. If they're sick, there's a problem. If they leave, there's a problem. Now, in uh, an environment like this, I think probably we're sufficiently of the stage where we're thinking that's not a great idea. But actually, I would suggest that in the world, there's actually still a large number of people like this down at level one. So level two, I think, is, well, we've got some documentation. We've got some runbooks. We've got some wikis. Maybe there's a massive Perl script that runs every so often. It was written once, and nobody's ever going to change it again because it's too terrifying. Or maybe we have some golden images. Those golden images sounded like a great idea, but they've been running for four years, and you've got no idea what happens, and you're scared of rebooting it. So that's your level two. 
So level three is using first and second generation configuration management tools. And by first and second generation, I mean CF Engine and early releases of Puppet. So these are really not really much more of a step beyond the scripts. They're, they're declarative. You can run them safely. Uh, and they are allowing you to put your code in a versioned way into version control, but it doesn't do much more than that. It's not really very sophisticated. So that's your level three. And then I think level four is where you're at the third, fourth generation configuration management tool. So that's where you've got the idea of desired state, the idea of a declarative interface onto the things that you want to configure. But you've also got some ideas. Perhaps you can do some search. Perhaps you can uh, get some data out of things. Perhaps uh, you might be able to do something across multiple sites. Basically, the kind of things that you can do with modern day Puppet, modern day Chef, possibly Ansible, possibly SaltStack. Those are the kind of third, fourth, current generation management tools. And then I think at the top level, there's people who are using those within an environment where they've also got some orchestration capability. Maybe they've got continuous delivery in place. They've got high level audit and reporting. They've got analytics. So that's the level five. And that's the people who are really, truly awesome. And I just think, as a stab in the dark, I reckon the, the distribution looks a bit like this. So you've got a, a small tail of people who are just truly woeful, still building snowflakes. And then a wodge of people who are still using documentation and maybe golden images. And then a growing number of people who are really using first and second generation config management tools. And then we're in an echo chamber where we think we're great because we're using contemporary stuff. But actually, we represent my battery is low. <laughs> oh, Matthew's battery is low, not my battery. Uh, Matthew, your battery is low. Um, so they represent actually a very small percentage, and then an even smaller percentage are at level five. Now, the interesting thing is, it's been said already by Steve, and I think it's fair that everybody would agree that within the DevOps space, within automation space, within open source space, Microsoft is a bit of the kind of the ugly second cousin, you know, not, 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 really, not really that loved. Um, so I would say that Microsoft is behind the curve when it comes to this stuff. But I would say it's closing fast. You need to watch it. But I would like to explore a couple of reasons why I think, historically, Microsoft has been behind the curve. And I think there are two things. And the first thing is down to the history of PowerShell, or rather the history of how Windows has been automated. So if you start in the early 90s, right the way up until 2000, basically, if you wanted to script something, automate something on Windows, well, good luck. You had some kind of fairly crappy scripting capability, but it was really poor. And it only really allowed you to get to a fraction, a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the capabilities of the operating system. Now, the world changed radically in 2002 when a research project called Monad, which ultimately became PowerShell, was born. And suddenly, we had a real proper piece of design and implementation of something which could be used to script and automate Windows. Now, Monad went into a beta release in 2005 and then was actually launched in 2006, with PowerShell 2 launched in 2009. So we're talking not long ago. Now, PowerShell is truly, truly awesome. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the stuff that you can do. But the thing you need to understand about PowerShell is, well, why was it born in the first place? I don't know how many of you ever, ever remember that there was an attempt to put Unix tools on Windows. It was called Unix Services for Windows. And it was terrible. It just didn't work. Well, here's why it didn't work. Have you ever tried running grep against Active Directory? Have you ever tried running sed against WMI? Well, it's not going to work, is it? And the reason is because Unix is built around the concept that everything is a file. Windows is built around the concept that everything is an API. Now, it's only until recently that those APIs are addressable. But nonetheless, regardless of whether or not you liked the way it was built, there were APIs there. You just couldn't get to them. And what PowerShell did was take the concept of a modular and pipeable piece of scriptable capability and instead of flowing text through it, flow objects through it. And that's what PowerShell is, and it's incredibly powerful. So, and, and it's not until 2013, last summer, that we start to get to level three, four. So where you've got really grown up desired state configuration, the ability to specify what you want and make sure that it happens, the ability to catch configuration drift, the ability to start to build your own tools, as Steve is doing, so that you can start to push up to level four and up to level five. So right now, that ecosystem's not there. So right now, it's only in the last year that we've even had the ability to take automation seriously in Windows with PowerShell. So let me look at this from the other side. Well, what about Chef? So Steve joked, well, yeah, Chef uh, doesn't work on Windows. Well, OK, the way Chef thinks and the way Puppet thinks and probably the way Ansible thinks 
is basically you only need three things if you're going to automate a system. You need a package, you need a service, and you need a file. That's it. That's all you need. There are a few edge cases, but basically that's going to get you 90% of the way. You'll install something, you'll render its config file, and you restart the service, and you're done. Well, that doesn't work on Windows. And so for that reason, config management tools built around that paradigm don't work on Windows. Now, it so happens that there's a lot of capabilities within Chef, and possibly with Puppet, I'm, I'm very much out of date in terms of Puppet's Windows capabilities, which fixes and bridges the gap. But until recently, the way that you would handle automation with Chef would be where well, you go as far as you can, which is really quite a long way with native resources, and then you dump into PowerShell. And that's OK. The problem is, once you've dumped into PowerShell, it's a black hole. You can't get information back very well. It's no longer part of your ecosystem. It's not very easy to do that. And so although we can do that, it's not actually that great. And so when you look at those two things, the very recent ability to do proper automation with Windows using PowerShell and the basic paradigm of third and fourth generation configuration management tools, that's why Windows has lagged behind a little bit. So I'm going to make the assertion that if you combine Chef with PowerShell DSC, you get to level five. You get the best of everything. So I'm going to explore how that means. So a quick dump into what desired state is. So um, Microsoft referred to desired state as make it so. So make it so. I'm going to define how I want it to be. And Windows, you take care of making it happen. So this is basically what desired state configuration is. So it's a set of extensions to PowerShell 4.0. Uh, you get it for free. You get it built in on Windows 8.1 and Server 2012 Release 2 recently, recently out. You can get it on earlier versions, Windows 7, <coughs> Server 2008, if you use WMF 4. So what it basically is is a declarative interface to your Windows automation, much like Puppet or Chef. It enables you to self-provision. So that is, you can say, this is the way I want my machine to be. Make it happen. Up pops the machine. It's exactly as you described. But it also allows you to catch configuration drift. So you can run it so that it will check in with the system every 15 minutes, every 30 minutes, and will say, whoa, hang on a minute. I'm no longer in line with the way you want me to be, and it will change. It has a resource and a provider model where you can extend it. And the resources basically specify, this is what I want you to do, and the provider is responsible for making it happen. Now, out of the box, there are 12 things that you can do already. So if I were to open up a brand new machine and run this command, get DSC resource, uh, you would see that there are 12 things you can do. You can do files, archives, environments, groups, logs, packages, registries, scripts, service, user, Windows features, and Windows process. For the record, you can do all 12 of those things with Chef. But nonetheless, this is very powerful. But where it gets more interesting uh, is in about two slides' time. So I'll tell you that in a second. Where it becomes more interesting uh, is that there's actually a very, very rapidly growing array of things where Microsoft product teams are enabling you to poke into more interesting stuff. And we'll cover that in a second. But briefly, how does it work? So what PowerShell 4 does with this extension is it gives you a DSL, much like Puppet or Chef, which allows you to specify what you want your systems to look like. That is then consumed by PowerShell or by WMI. And you can converge these nodes. You can do it manually by running a commandlet, or there's a push, or there's a pull model, which allows you to say, this machine, make it happen. And similarly, if you want to actually make sure that it's checking, what you're able to do is test. So you're able to say, verify that I am in alignment with the way you want my system to be. Oh, I'm not. Change it. That's basically how it works. It's very straightforward. You're building a document which specifies how you want the world to be, and you're telling Windows to make it happen. So this is an example of what your thing looks like. So that's actually PowerShell's DSL. And you'll see in a second, it looks very similar if you start to break it down to something that you see in Chef. So the DSC resource kit, this is the interesting thing. So since Christmas, uh, just after Christmas, Boxing Day, since Boxing Day last year, six releases of additional resources have been released by Microsoft product teams. Now, they're all experimental, which means it could eat your cat. But ultimately, they're very powerful and very usable. And they're being used in production by people like Stack Overflow and other people. So there's over 80 resources right now. So when I ran this this afternoon, get DSC resource, Pipe through measure optic dash line. That's the same as WC minus L. Uh, there's 89 resources. Now, that's including the two lines of output. So there's 87 resources available right now. So these include the ability to plug straight into Azure, to manage the Active Directory, to build a failover cluster, set up MySQL servers, set up Samba shares, Windows updates, and more. So this is very, very powerful. Now, the vision for DSC, and this is the bit that's actually truly exciting from a Microsoft perspective. 
The vision is to create an open ecosystem which allows third-party tools to automate Windows systems. And so you might say, well, okay, if I've, got, if I've got DSC, why would I want to use Chef? Or why would I want to use Ansible or anything else? Well, the similar thing is to say, uh, how many of you use Perfmon as the one thing to monitor your entire infrastructure? Well, you don't, do you? You use data which is surfaced by Microsoft's ability to give you metrics, and then you consume that with something else and integrate it with other tools. This is Microsoft Vision. And an interesting thing is to extend this concept to all the devices in the data center. You can already use DSC to drive Arista switches or to use drive Cisco switches. You can already use it to drive Linux switches. So what that means is if you have a configuration management tool that can plug into DSC, suddenly you own the world. You own the data center. And DSC is a standard criteria now for all Microsoft products as of 2015. Every Microsoft product will support DSC. OK, so that's the Microsoft bit. What about the Chef bit? This is the bit that I actually know about. Um, so quick overview of Chef. So Chef's an automation framework. You've all heard of it. It likewise has a declarative Ruby DSL. It's a hydrogenous system automation. You can run it across pretty much every operating system you care to mention. It has a convergent infrastructure model. So you say, I want my system to be like this. You run Chef and the system converges towards your desired state. It's server-based or standalone if you prefer. It's push or pull. You can send jobs to be run, or you can run them by calling against your chef server. But in addition to all of this, you've got high reporting capabilities. You've got search. You've got the ability to check your inventory and search through it, and various kinds of analytics. And then on top of that, you've got a very thriving unit and integration testing ecosystem, which allows you to truly treat infrastructure as code, to push it through a continuous delivery pipeline, much as you would the rest of your infrastructure code. And it also plugs into all the well-known clouds and also the well-known virtualization uh, technologies, unfortunately not Hyper-V. Uh, and of course, there are orchestration capabilities as well. So when you see this, that's actually pretty much a definition of what you need to be on level five on my model. So, the Chef and Windows history then. So it was back in 2011, Knife Windows was released, which would allow you to bootstrap machines and run Chef against them from the command line on a Linux machine. Then the PowerShell, IIS, SQL Server, and Windows cookbooks, which were mentioned earlier, and these are still in development. Now, one of the great things about Ruby is because it's 100% Ruby, if you want to add things to the Chef ecosystem, you just write it in Ruby and ship it in a cookbook and it's available. And that's a really good way of releasing preview technology. And you'll see the pattern as you look through the timeline. What happened was stuff that started in the cookbook has become more mature and then makes its way into Core Chef. So this has happened with registry key, PowerShell, and batch script. We have a Chef client which runs as a Windows service. Uh, and then last year, it was announced that desired state support would be released in 2014. It will be released very, very shortly. DSC Preview, which I'll show you shortly. Uh, DSC Preview was uh, open sourced in July, and the DSC Script resource will be in, uh, in Core Chef in the next release, which will be very soon. So <clears throat> how does Chef and DSC work? Well, there's a PowerShell resource that already exists if you want to just poke at it and run PowerShell scripts. But this surfaces two new resources, the DSC resource and the DSC Script. So these are native Chef resources which map onto your DSC resources. So if you know what DSC resource you want to use, you can drive it from Chef. You can also embed PowerShell DSC scripts. So you can stick PowerShell in your Ruby recipe and shove it in and it will work. You can do the same with a moth. Uh, but then on top of that, you can get integrated reporting analytics and audit back. So this is the difference. This is what you can't do when you run a PowerShell script. Because when you run a PowerShell script, Chef is no longer in charge. Chef is saying, OK, I'm running this thing over here that you trust, but I know nothing about that. So you can't get the information back unless you write it yourself. Whereas the DSC resource and DSC script will actually be able to say, well, I ran this, and this is what happened. Or you could run it in Y run road and find out what you think would happen if you ran it. Uh, so this is available as a technology preview. Phase 1 will be integrated in the next release. And phase 2, DSC resource, which I'm going to talk about next, uh, will be released afterwards. So here's DSC resource. So it provides an analog to the DSC DSL. So this is what you would stick in your chef recipe. So DSC resource, give it a name, do end. This is the resource name. <clears throat> what is it that you're actually going to use? What Microsoft DSC resource are you going to drive? And what properties are there? And that's it. That is enough to do all that you need to do in order to, in this case, find the DSC resource kits uh, somewhere on the file system uh, and unzip it into PowerShell modules. So here's how you'd start to use that. Here's how you build your resources. First thing you'd do is you'd look to see what DSC resources you've got. So in this case, we might think, well, 
we're, uh, we're interested in, I don't know, package or service. And then what you could do is say, well, okay, I'm interested in service. Show me some more about the service. So get DSC service pipe through select object expand property properties. And now you've got the documentation. This basically tells you these are the parameters that you must have. And then when you've got that, you can build up your system. So you set the resource name attribute to the name of the resource as a symbol. So for example, Windows feature is going to become curl on Windows feature. Cases isn't important. And then you just set the properties as a tuple of property name and then value. So here we have the thing again, DSC resource there. That's your resource name and here are your properties. So really very, very simple, very straightforward. So comparing them side by side, this is the PowerShell that you would write if you were doing it yourself. Uh, and this is how you would drive it through Chef. And what that means is right now, if you install the DSC cookbook, you have access to all 87 resources provided by Microsoft right now in your Chef recipes today. You can do that right this second. So DSC script is the second thing. DSC script is basically just being able to embed <coughs> your code in here. So here it is, I just shoved it in there. Uh, and there's no translation from DSL. Not really very interesting. OK, so we'll try and do a demo. No. Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? OK, well, I would do the demo apart from the fact I appear not to be able to get out of my Ah, well, OK. Why can't I escape? I'm trying to just escape from my <laughs> slides. Oh, well, never mind. I can show you the demo later. The demo is it's really, really super simple. It's a five minute demo. All we do is we use the DSC resource. And what we do is we install IIS and we drop off a file that says, woo, that was easy. And all that happens is we run Chef and you'll see it say, Using the DSC resource uh, Windows feature IIS, IIS will install, and then you'll drop off a file using Chef. So you're using both sides, traditional Chef and then the DSC resource, and out will pop a configured IIS server in about 30 seconds. It's not really a very interesting demo, but just shows you it working in real life. So what's the, what's the future then? You know what? Actually, this is now not working at all. I can't actually show you the rest of my slides. So let's see if we can let's switch it back on again. Wow. OK. Well, I'll just tell you what the slides say, because my computer is actually just not working at all. Um, so the future, um, basically, I was going to say that the future that you have is basically broken down into two things. What's the future from Microsoft perspective? Well, the future from Microsoft perspective is that DSC is going to be in the core engineering criteria so that every single Microsoft product must have DSC support. And I already mentioned to you this idea about the data center abstraction layer and the idea that there are open standards which allow you to poke into everything using DSC. That's Microsoft's vision. It's very important. It's very exciting. Chef's vision is to make this uh, into core Chef. And then there will be further releases taking functionality which is currently embedded in the Windows cookbook, moving it into core Chef, doing things like making bootstrapping with WinRM better, uh, and other other cookbooks, Active Directory, WSUS, things like that. But the thing that I'm excited about is, for example, you find yourself in a situation where you have to integrate with a company Active Directory server. Or you find yourself in a situation where you've been told, it's been mandated that you must use Exchange. And you're from a Linux background. Well, now you're in a situation where you're going to expect Microsoft to surface all that you need in terms of an addressable API that you can drive from your configuration management tool of choice. I think that's terribly powerful. And so my conclusion is that the combination of Chef and DSC is absolutely the way to get to level five in the Windows infrastructure world. Uh, and there are a load of very interesting links, which I'll put out the slides and you can see if you want to read more about how Chef works with Windows and how DSC works itself. Thank you very much. I think Matthew just covered this. So I'm Owen Perry. I'm a software architect here at Just Giving. I've only been here um, a handful of months. Um, and really nice to have you all here, um, enjoying our new, brand new offices, which we've only been in for a handful of weeks as well. So welcome all. Um, what's Just Giving? I thought I'd just do a quick plug for us, in case you haven't heard of us. We um, enable people to... Um, raise money for charity, um, but we also obviously have a lot of tech 
um, behind that. Um, and in terms of you know uh, how much traffic and that kind of stuff, so we turn over about you know 400 million um, a year. We, we have somewhere between 20 and 75 transactions a minute uh, at peak load. Um, and occasionally, there's a case like a guy called Stephen Sutton, um, who tragically died of cancer uh, a few months ago. When that went viral, we just got floored completely by you know staggering amounts of traffic. So our, our our load profiles are quite unpredictable, which um, in that particular instance made it quite exciting, uh, to say the least. Um, so it's funny, I, I wrote this talk completely in isolation to all the other three. Um, so the sort of chatting with Matthew is like, oh, well, what should I write, do a talk about? Um, this in principle is a sort of, if you're doing um, infrastructure code in the Windows space, this is a bit of some of the stuff that you might want to think about. Um, so, just out of curiosity, how many people are doing infrastructure automation in general? Yeah, I guess that doesn't come unsurprising that it's about 95%, um, give or take uh, a couple of percent, which is not surprising for this particular meetup group, I guess. Um, uh, that, was my, that was my quick poll. Um, so, just to kind of give you a, an idea of at least where we're at with just giving, um, feel free to play some buzzword bingo here. Um, at the moment, we've kind of got a big monolithic application. We're trying to chop it up into lots of microservices. We want to use event-based architectures with CQRS and event stores, um, yada, yada, yada. Um, and so we're kind of going through a huge amount of change. Um, the uh, beginning of the year, our hosting model was very much, there were 20 boxes, and they were all beautiful snowflakes. Um, everyone pristine and shiny and, and, and um, nice, nicely crystalline. And actually, as a result of the Stephen Sutton um, fiasco, to some extent, I call it a fiasco because we got to a point we were throwing servers at, at the problem, you know, taking them out of dev and, and, and firing them up and getting them running, running in prod because we were, you know, absolutely on our knees. And we got to a point where our ISP basically went, um, we haven't got any more capacity, that's it. And we were like, fuck. Uh, and, and literally, we were like that because we heard that... Um, a uh, oh, really famous person who's just plopped out of my brain um, was about to tweet about it. He has a big following in America. And we were like, God, if, if America starts hitting us with traffic, we are really genuinely screwed. As a result of that, we kind of thought maybe we need a bit more of an industrial strength um, supplier. So we kind of moved to, to you know, spun up AWS and that suddenly became a bit more of a priority than it had been in the past. So that kind of... Um, led us kicking and screaming into the fact that we needed to do some infrastructure automation. And so I kind of wanted to, you know, sort of talk a bit about some of the stuff that perhaps needs to be thought about um, as you go along that, along that journey, because some of it's perhaps not uh, as obvious as you'd like. Um, so in terms of our estate at the moment, with all the a AWS stuff, we've got, a, you know, two, three hundred boxes, um, which is a far cry from the, the 20 web servers we had humming in the corner. It's quite amazing how uh, once you've got that credit card in there, you can just start ramping, ramping them up. Um, but it's all right, it's not my credit card, so it's okay. Um, yeah, so I can't remember what I wanted to say for that slide. Hang on, let me, let me, let me catch up. Uh, why do we do automa automation? So ah, actually, yeah, so I w I'll tell you another little story about um, this is kind of rolling into the future of well, rolling into the future as far as this presentation is concerned, but where we were a few weeks ago. So we built some nice microservices, loads of pressure to, to deliver it. We decided to deliver it. Um, and so, so we were going live on the Tuesday. The Friday beforehand, uh, we noticed some interesting, unexpected behaviors. And so we started uh, burying into it and realized that um, in our stack, we were using a a thing called chocolatey, which I'll come to in a minute, um, had decided to upgrade itself. And in, in with the, the, the connection between Chef and chocolatey basically got every single server in our estate into a broken state. And that was a bit of a oh god moment when we realized this. Um, so that's the power of infrastructure automation, right? You can break <laughs> yourself really, really, really quickly. Um, but then on the flip side, the realization was, well, actually, you know what? We can rebuild our entire estate from a handful of scripts. So we just deleted everything and went, went around the scripts and went to lunch. And about an hour later, our entire estate was back in, you know, in working order. So 
you know, uh, with great power comes great responsibility. But I think that for me was the first, so I've been doing infrastructure automation for a while, but that was the first moment where I was like, wow, this stuff is awesome. When, you know, you could literally, we just went to lunch, came back and all the machines were there. You know, and this is in dev, prod and, uh, dev staging and prod. So that was r really quite a, a cool thing as far as I was concerned. Um, and, and a real testament to where this stuff really starts to pay dividends when, when you're in that, in that state. So as far as we're concerned, um, this is kind of roughly our, our, our tech stack. We've got, we've got some Windows, we've got some, a tiny smattering of Linux. Um, again, before I, I joined, there was none. Now that, you know, we've got Chef servers and a few, a few other boxes. Um, we're heavy, heavy users of Chef, um, partially because I think it's really awesome, but partially because it's a great tool, uh, and partially because none of us knew Puppet. Um, so it seems like a, a good way to go. Um, a, a tool that is, for me personally, really revolutionary is Vagrant. Um, I can't stress how awesome Vagrant is in terms of being able to work in, in, the, in this space. Um, you know, being effectively allowing you to kind of, you know, hack out infrastructure on your, on your desktop um, while on the train to Wales is, is just fantastic. Uh, I live in Wales, by the way, so that wasn't just a random, uh, a random thing. Um, and then there's a bunch of, I, I think as, as um, Stephen alluded to, there are a bunch of uh, test frameworks um, around Chef that really allow you to get into um, testing stuff at quite a macro level. Um, I think it's, it takes quite a long time to, to build up those suite of tests uh, and quite a lot of experience. But I think, you know, coming from a position where we have been in the past, where every server is a snowflake and in the heads of the, the one ops guy who's, you know, a bit of a hero, to a place where now we can start writing tests and, and building up test packs, um, that's a really powerful place to be. Um, so perhaps the, the slightly more sort of, um, well, not necessarily contentious, but kind of, um, Areas where I think, you know, it's, it's listening to about DSC and, and, and listening to some of the interesting stuff Microsoft have done. Um, the areas around package management um, leaves are somewhat uh, to be desired. So, you know, but Chocolatey as a, as a package management tool is, is definitely up there. And uh, hosting your packages, Artifactory and is, is definitely a, an important thing to consider, which I'll come to in a minute. And then um, with, the, with the Chef stack, um, really, you know, Ruby and PowerShell start to become um, definitely important technologies to learn. Um, it's quite interesting. I, I'm, I, I really, really want to like PowerShell, um, but I, I don't know. As a sort of, I, I, I come from a more of a de developer background, and it just, for me personally, doesn't flow from the fingers. But maybe I just need to read the manual. Um, whereas Ruby, I, I absolutely, I've, I've not written much of it, but. Uh, in the last few months, I've been writing a lot more, and you know, I'm quite liking it. But to be honest, the two things have their 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 rightful place uh, in this particular stack. Um, and Berkshelf uh, is a bit, uh, probably a bit uh, detailed for this talk, but um, nicely couples Chef in terms of you know, gluing together Vagrant and Chef and so on. Um, yeah, so I guess. Uh, if, you, if, you ca if you're looking for somewhere to start, although it sounds like a lot of people are already there, um, I think uh, probably the, the most important thing is trying to choose a configuration management tool, um, which I guess uh, in the Windows space is fairly straightforward to look at, uh, to look at Chef. Um, I think Pup the, the Windows support in Puppet is improved, and Ansible's just not got any unless anyone can tell me otherwise. And they've, uh, and just, they've just a second. Ah, right. Okay. So they're they're kind of creeping, cre creeping up. Um, so yeah, choosing. Um, hang on. Let me let me just do a very unprofessional run away because I just need to grab some liquid. Um, yeah. So choosing package management that that becomes quite a uh, a really important thing. Um, kind of covered why chef. Uh, what did I want to say on? What did I want to say on this? Um, so, um, yeah, I guess using um, tools like Vagrant um, becomes kind of 
vitally important when trying to write stuff, um, you know, write, writing chef code and even some of the PowerShell stuff and, and you know, all, all, all your, all your um, basically your implementations because uh, it really allows you to kind of spin up a machine, you know, ex execute your code, uh, typically using Chef Solo or um, some of the other frameworks and actually, you know, completely destroy a machine um, and see how you've destroyed it and then tear it down and have another have another go. Um, that cycle tends to, you know, um, be a fairly frequent thing. I think again, one of the really frustrating things about working in the Windows space is um, we don't have containers. So this man here wrote a book on test-driven uh, development using Chef, and you read the book and go, "Ah, oh, this is awesome!" And, and you know, you you, you kind of uh, do these fast test cycles and then you then you look into the detail and you go, ah, they're using Windows containers. So, you know, the ability to kind of uh, spin up a machine or a conceptual machine, run some tests, tear it down, um, is quite a fast feedback loop. Whereas on the Windows side of things, a vagrant image tends to be somewhere between 4 to 12 gig. And so every time you want to spin up a machine, it has to copy the damn thing across your hard drive. Great if you've got SSDs. Uh, it certainly speeds it up, but even so, the, the, the life, that life cycle is, is definitely a lot clunkier. Um, I really hope Microsoft decide to do something like containers soon, but maybe they won't because um, they like to sell licenses. I don't know. It's an it's an it's an interesting uh, it's an interesting thing to see if they'll kind of replicate that. Um, if you do need to build um, vagrant images, the other kind of mild frustrating thing with Microsoft is they sell licenses. So um, normally, you can download a, a machine, uh, you know, uh, a Git repository with a Vagrant file in, do Vagrant up, and it'll download the image for you. But because in the Microsoft world, thou shalt not share, um, you kind of have to build your own uh, images. So uh, if you do need to do that, um, there's a thing called Packer, which is just awesome in terms of for, for building uh, base images um, to work off. Um, so th this is one of my more favorite um, topics. Um, back in the 90s, um, the Unix world um, in invented things like RPMs and apt-get. Um, and they were quite a cool thing, really. You could install software from, from the command line and so on. Um, in the Windows space, all you really have, there are, there are a few sort of skirmishes into trying to do this uh, over the years. Um, but all that's really there at the moment is, is um, chocolatey. And I love chocolatey. I think it's a fantastic movement in the right direction. Um, but, you know, a few weeks ago it made me come rather <laughs> unstuck and I didn't particularly like it for that day. Um, and, and whilst it's still, uh, you know, a, it's a, an amazing open source project, there's a lot of community, a lot of people behind it, they're doing a lot of good work. Um, it's still a bit like RPMs were back in 1995, 6, 7. Um, and it, to be honest, it's a bit, it's a bit frustrating that, um, you know, a thing that is perhaps so fundamental to being able to install software um, is still a bit string and sticky tape as far as its implement implementation is concerned. Um, Microsoft have obviously started to catch up on this, so they've produced a thing called uh, One, One Get which is effectively um, the PowerShell version of, of Chocolatey. Um, but then the other thing to be aware of, or you know, be aware of in, um, in the Microsoft land is that uh, the way the, the packages work in Microsoft is you download your package and then it goes off and downloads Notepad++ from you know, notepad.com and it'll pull down that installer and install that. This is great, you know, it, it works. However, if you've got a server estate of two, 300 machines and you want to spin some up and notepad.com is down, then what do you do? So you're, you're essentially coupling yourself to the entire internet effectively, um, which is perhaps, you know, not particularly industrial. Um, so I, I guess one of the hints there is, well, all of this stack works and it works well, but you probably have to go through a, a phase if you want to use this kind of package management of actually packaging a lot of the stuff yourself, and you know hosting it internally on, on your own artifact uh, on your own yeah artifact repository, um, but then that comes with a whole that's a whole bunch of time you've got to spend effectively doing stuff that you know these people in the Unix world just go I oh, know we've already got this for free um, so so it's a bit it's a bit frustrating um, but I guess who was it 
have that slide that says, you know, doing, doing stuff on Windows sort of takes 10 times the amount of time it does on Linux. That's definitely, you know, in the package world, um, it's definitely where we're at. Um, did I want to say anything else? Uh, no, not really. I'm, I'm, I, I realize I'm a gateway between you and the pub, um, so I bet I'm going to crack on. Uh, one of the other important things, um, at least in, in our stack, it was interesting, you know, uh, I haven't used Octopus and, and, and how, how that um, changes some of these things. It's definitely something I'm going to be looking at. But um, for us, you know, is, is where you store your artifacts. So whether it's Notepad++ um, or in our side of things, you know, um, our, our actual builds uh, for all our software are also stored as, as packages and, and we install uh, our software just like we would any of the other software on a server. Um, so if, if you're you know, wanting to use um, kind of the free ones, you, know, you can use um, the chocolatey.org or NuGet um, system, but it doesn't scale uh, very well. Uh, and uh, I learned that a few years ago. Um, so it works for, for small implementations, but after a certain time, you, know, you kind of need, need something a bit more industrial. Um, so uh, the real two players on the market is, a, is, is Nexus and, and um, JFrog's Artifactory. Um, and they start to come things with high availability and, and replication and resilience and all, the, all of that good stuff. So, you know, uh, if you're using package management, suddenly your, your artifact repository is at the center of your infrastructure. And if it's down, everything's down or your ability to kind of, you know, apply change is down. So actually it starts to make sense to spend a, a bit of time and money on what suddenly becomes quite a core cool component in, uh, in, in your system. Um, I was going to wax lyrical about um, some of the stuff in terms of uh, Chef and, and, and testing. So Chef have done some, um, s some awesome stuff about wrapping up uh, a load of open source uh, projects into what they've called the Chef DK. Um, and um, one, of, one of them is, is, is a sort of system called Test Kitchen, which basically allows you to execute um, your cookbook on multiple um, OSs. So if you are supporting, you know, Win Windows and Linux, and um, then and, and the different variants of Linux, um, then you know it kind of makes makes that easy. Um, Mini test is probably the sort of simpler place to start, which is you know um, effectively you spin up your Windows machine, you apply some changes, and then you can say quite easily in a little bit of Ruby, does the file C program files Notepad.exe exist? Um, so if you're starting out it, along this journey, um, even some of those tests that are quite um, straightforward and simple uh, really start to pay dividends um, as, 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 as you progress because, uh, you know, it's amazing for how easy it is for, say, something like Chocolatey to fail in unexpected ways, and then you, you realize that that app that you thought was installed wasn't installed, but these tests um, kind of pick that stuff up. And then it gets quite interesting when you realize that actually you can run these tests in production on the machines that you've spun up in production. And so not only is this a thing that you're using just to develop against, but actually you write the tests in the right way, they can actually be testing your production system at runtime. And then that starts to get quite an interesting you know, um, thing uh, and a powerful thing uh, in terms of you know, being able to test yourself all the way through your, the, the life cycle. Uh, what else do I want to say? Uh, um, so I was I was actually at a she uh, chef community talk a couple of days ago um, at, at Skills Matter, and I, I was chatting to some guys there, and they'd sort of been starting out with Chef, and um, I was actually asking them if they use CI, and, and I was a bit disturbed that they didn't even know what CI was. Um, even though they sounded like quite seasoned software developers uh, and, and until, I don't know if I should say this, until I found out they worked for Ac Accenture. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, and then <laughs> uh, did I come out loud? Sorry. Uh, um, but one of the things that I think is quite uh, important is actually building a, a, a CI pipeline for uploading your stuff to, uh, in our case, the Chef server, but the same pattern works for Puppet or Ansible, I'm sure. Um, you know, getting that automation uh, in place. I mean, it was it was pretty much covered um, earlier on. But you know, g 
getting that automation in place in terms of um, applying the same software development um, techniques that you would for um, building you know, your application software still applies for, for infrastructure. Um, um, so yeah, uh, definitely do some of that. Uh, what do I want to say from here? Um, so the actual sort of writing the, the, the Windows-y um, code to actually configure your Windows machines. Um, so in, in, at least in terms of Chef, um, I was going to say that there's, there's, there's good support. Uh, and then I crossed that out and said there's OK support um, because um, it, could, you know, it could be a lot better. I think seeing what um, I just saw about the whole DSE stuff kind of definitely sort of takes that up a level. And, and that's definitely an interesting space to watch. Um, I think up, up until recently, you know, you find you, you, in the Windows space, you've definitely found that you have to work quite hard um, to uh, access different parts of your systems um, and, and uh, either through native Ruby code or, or you know, through a fair amount of custom PowerShell. And then, and then you know, kind of Windows throws some slight subtle curveballs at you. So like, what is a user? So you know, um, in in the Unix world, you create a user called some user, and it's called some user. Great. On, on Windows, if you create a local user, you can call it dot slash some user, you can call it machine name slash some user, or you could call it you know some user. And if it's joined to the domain some user, is that user a domain user or is it a local user? And you know, those different ways of describing the same concept um, can get you into a right awkward state. Um, so you kind of sometimes need to think about um, the, the sort of little quirks that Windows throws at you um, in terms of, you know, um, how, you, how you approach some of these things. Uh, one of the other things that, uh, at least in, I, I'm not sure about Puppet or Ansible, but at least in the Chef, uh, is the idea of, you know, idempotency, so doing something once and, and only once, no matter how many times you, you try and do it. Uh, again, and, and I, I guess Steve hints at this, you know, if, if you shell out to PowerShell, then you kind of have to wrap all of that stuff up and try and assert, you know, ha has this PowerShell script done the thing that it said it was going to do? Um, and that can make, make your life, you know, um, quite hard or interesting. Um, not, that you can't, n not that you can't do it, but it, it, it's definitely, you know, stuff that you have to think about a lot more in the Windows side of things than I think you, than you do in, in Linux. Uh, one of the other gotchas um, that's worth uh, thinking about is group policy. Um, so at a previous employer, um, there was the sysadmins guys, we're, we're Windows guys, you know, we use group policy, we control everything through group policy. And they're like, well, hey, yeah, we're, we're, you know, being cool and groovy and trying to do everything with Chef. And suddenly you're like, well, who's in charge, right? Because, you know, with Chef, you create this user, group policy comes along and goes, I don't like that user, I'm going to delete it. And the next thing you're in this war of attrition between um, what, when the chef run happened and when group policy happened. Um, and I guess, you know, you really kind of need to decide who's in charge here or, or if there's a boundary, you know, what boundary sh should not be, is owned by group policy and stuff. But it's definitely a, a thing that I would like to have known that before I, before I had this um, you know, war of attrition with the, with the, the, the Windows admins. Uh, um, frustrating things. Okay, I'm, I might have said a few, but I'm going to kind of just do my, my last one. Um, I wish Microsoft would make up their mind about how you install software. So .NET, I don't know if anyone's installed .NET 3.5 on, on, on a Windows box. Um, you have to, you, you can't install it through uh, an installer. You can't install it as a package. You have to install it using Windows features. Um, which is fine, but .NET 2, you install it one way, .NET 4.5 for uh, all of the other versions of .NET, uh, you can install in any other way apart from this one thing. And, and whilst I can kind of understand the decisions they made, um, I think Microsoft really need to kind of get it together and try and simplify some of this stuff. Hopefully the DSC stuff might, might be a, a, a movement in that, in that way. But there are definitely lots of you know, um, other 
kind of frustrating things that come along. So using Vagrant, it uses WinRM in. Uh, you want to install .NET 4, um, <coughs> it needs to install a, a small service pack to do that. But you're not al allowed to install service packs through WinRM. Ah, so, you know, I guess this sort of highlights the, you know, um, what was said before about sometimes with Windows takes 10 times longer because you kind of have to work, work, you know, find these workarounds. So um, I guess working on Windows, you know, is, is, is in, in automation is kind of, um, it's possible, but yeah, you certainly need a bit more patience. Um, and I, I was just going to describe another quick story um, to wrap up, uh, if only again to just sort of say how awesome um, uh, infrastructure automation is. Um, so, in fact, yesterday we had some servers that were um, were up and running. They've been running a while. In fact, post this release a while back, and then we uh, noticed they'd all run out of disk space. And it turned out, yeah, again, it was a configuration setting. Um, it was writing caches to disk. And uh, <coughs> once we sussed this out, we we kind of logged into the machine, old school style, and uh <coughs> looked at the folder and was like, right click, delete. And you know, the little Microsoft bar came in, you know, sort of counting files, and there was, you know, X thousand, thirty, fifty, ninety, hundred, hundred, and hundred and fifty thousand. And the minute counter was going up, so you know, ten, fifteen, twenty minutes, thirty minutes to, to delete, and we're like, oh bloody hell. And then um one of my colleagues, a bright spark, just went, Well actually, hang on we built all this stuff automatically um, so we just failed over um, so we, we've got green, green blue deployments here so we just failed over everything over to the other to the other side and then just deleted the machines and then rebuilt them and it took 10 minutes so it, that was just like again it was one of those realizations of that infrastructure automation is just awesome because rather than you know waiting around watching windows deleting files we just blew it away and it was quicker to rebuild the boxes um, <coughs> so yeah, the kind of uh, quick wrap up. Um, I think if you're doing this stuff, you need to think about a configuration manager. Get your head around Vagrant because it's it is just awesome. Um, suss, suss out package management. Um, you know there, there are there are many uh, interesting challenges that come with, that come with package management. Um, try and do TDD. It's difficult, I think, to do um, TDD. Uh, in general, so it definitely takes some discipline, but I think it's a discipline that pays off. Um, you know, get some continuous integration in place, um, write code, and try not to get too frustrated every few hours. Um, and yeah, delete your estate every now and again and rebuild it because it's just brilliant. Um, <coughs> so that was me. <coughs>